Thank you. Um, we're now taking up S-163, an act relating to state court jurisdiction for special immigrant juvenile status. And we have with us An Anarchy. Anarchy. I'm sorry, Director Reddick. I have messed up more names than this week. I must it's be ready for a week uh, for a week off. <laughs> it's the spelling; it throws everybody off. It's Erica. Well, I was trying, you know, and I. It's not like we haven't met before. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the bill is one seven one sixty three, and. Um, it's really a, anytime we get into immigration status and so forth, um, we did think we should hear from the Department of Children and Families, which is often charged with taking care of these kids. So if you or Jennifer Micah, the counsel for the department, wish to speak on this, we'd appreciate any thoughts you have. Great. I will just do a few words of introduction and then turn it over to Jennifer. Fine. So good morning, Chairman Sears and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erica Radke, Deputy Commissioner of the Family Services Division of DCF. I'd like to thank you all for inviting us today to discuss Senate Bill 163. The DCF does have some questions or concerns about what the bill would require for the department in terms of guardianship for individuals over the age of 18 that would require this special immigrant status. And with that being said, I'll turn it over to DCF General Counsel Jennifer Micah, who will provide uh, specific details outlining our position. Okay. Jennifer? We can't hear you, Jennifer. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm Jennifer Micah, DCF General Counsel. You've asked us to present testimony on S-163 relating to special immigrant st status for juveniles, the purpose of which was explained to you by Rebecca Turner and Jill Rudge, um, namely to provide Vermont courts with the jurisdiction they need to provide youth with a venue to get a hearing that can lead to greater opportunities for citizenship offered already by the federal government. I understand that you passed the up to age 18 bill uh, almost exactly two years ago. And I understand that it was slightly derailed by the lockdowns, which is why you didn't get up to age 21. Um, Erin Jacobson has filled me in a little bit on that and she'll, she might talk to you a little bit more. Um, so the, the reason the age it didn't go up to age 21, I think, is just the confusion that arises as any time you go past age 18 due to issues around adulthood. Um, in the nearly two years that this bill, bill has been on the books and recognizing that these guardianships were, in fact, happening before, even before the legislation was passed, DCF has not had a youth placed in our custody um, for these purposes that we, I have been able to ascertain in reaching out to as many people at DCF as I could. I have spoken with Erin Jacobson and, I, and Rebecca Turner about this bill. And by and large, we don't have concerns about it, except for the fact that there is confusion about whether the over age 18 includes DCF custody when it talks about guardianship. And um, on page five, section five, the language states that a person's, that a court is permitted to extend guardianship beyond a person's 18th birthday. It does not have any exemption for DCF, nor does it specifically state that DCF is included. We do maintain custody over people who are 18 or over for CHINS cases. We do not do it for anything else, but we do have extended care agreements with youth. Those are not custodial in that they do not arise from a court hearing or from a court order. Those are purely voluntary. This is something different that would require the, a court order for this guardianship. And we do not currently have capacity for that. So if that is something that is going to be asked of us, we would need to talk about what impact that might have on 
um, the work that we already do. But like I said, I have been in touch with Rebecca and with Erin, and we have all agreed that we need to keep talking about it and are working together to, to see what we can do to come up with language that would be acceptable to all of us. Because I, I think there is still some disagreement around that particular piece. Okay. So um, are you looking for questions? Yeah, does that complete your testimony on the? Yes, it does. Thank you. The rest, rest of the bill is okay. Yes, yeah, that, sorry, that's, DCF. That's, that's really the only issue we have is what does it mean for DCF's um, custody of over 18s? Um, Alice, did you have a comment or question? Uh, I do have some. I do have, a, uh, I think, two questions. Oh, I just lost them when I turned to that page. Just a moment, please. I was, um, the section I was asking about was on page six of seven, section F. Um, it's, a, it's talking about referral for services or protection. And an at-risk non-citizen who is the subject of a petition for special findings under the section may be referred for psychiatric, psychological, education, occupational, medical, dental, social services, et cetera. And what I'm wondering about is you, you may be re somebody who's not even, uh, the petition has not gone through, but a petition has been filed, um, would, be, would, would DCF be responsible for paying for all of these services? Who would be paying for these things? Are they, and would they be eligible for um, Medicaid? So those are questions that I think Erin Jacobson would be better um, positioned to answer because she has in fact done this work and she was involved in the drafting of the bill. So I think that she would be the one to an ask, answer those specific questions. I was curious about that when I listened to the testimony last week though, about who, who where do the kids go for these evaluations and who will, would pay for them? Right, and, and also the, at the line 19 of the same page, it says that the section um, shall be liberally construed. So it seems like, you know, that would be one thing. If, if you're looking at it liberally, it seems like, yes, DCF might be responsible. Who knows? But um, it could be another department. There's no specific language around the budget, budgeting for that in, in here anywhere. Right. Um, and I'm also looking on page four. Um, there's a couple of places in section B, it uses the terms has suffered from abuse, neglect, abandonment, or a similar or similar circumstances. I mean, just kind of seems very loose, similar circumstances. And not that I you have to answer that, but it's certain and line 18 also, when it speaks about when considering an at-risk non-citizen child's health safety, well for the court shall consider whether present or past living conditions will adversely affect the child's physical, mental, or emotional health. Um, what are they looking for? I'm not sure what's going on there. I think that's um, those are other questions, Karen. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, are there any questions for DCF? I think it's pretty clear. Your concern is the 18, age 18 to 21. And currently that's only a voluntary situation for kids who have been abused or neglected. Is that correct? That's correct. It's voluntary and and outside of a court. There's no court involvement in that. In Unfortunately, that. yeah. Uh, we found, I found out today at the last minute that Rebecca Wasserman is not available to us and she's going to listen to this on YouTube. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, going to have to figure out how to answer some of Senator Nick's questions. But for the present, in terms of DCF, you have no questions about the rest of the bill. It's just that one fact. We just really need clarification on whether the expectation is that DCF would be taking kids into custody who are over age 18 and what would be our responsibilities in that regard. And obviously, we would. we feel our system is already strained. And so it would be a, a heavy lift for us, even, even if there weren't that many, which it seems that there aren't, but it could also become a more widely used um, avenue if, it did, if people did start 
realizing that it was available. Um, and we don't currently have, for instance, something like extended foster care, which other states might have. And we would like to do that, but we need more funding and we would need more staff for that. And that's, we are planning that, but that's in the future. So this would be an element of that, but not, we're not really not ready for it yet. Okay. And I would also add that uh, some of the language that Senator Nick uh, pointed out too, where it was ambiguous in terms of uh, neglect or treatment from the past, then those types of issues really would not fit into our statutory scheme either. So I wouldn't, those youth would not really be able to be under our jurisdiction. So there, there does seem to be some ambiguity that would need to be addressed. Okay. And if I could just make one more clarification about the kids who are in extended care, those are kids that are already known to us. They come up through as when they're when they're minors, and then mm -hmm. they can stay in the system if they choose to. But this yeah. allows potentially would allow you know a 19 or 20 year old to be placed in our custody, which would be very really, very difficult yeah. for us not knowing. No, it. Yeah. My assumption is those voluntary arrangements are sometimes kids who were graduated from high school and you don't want yeah. to ship them off at 18 um, or even college students or whatever. And you're trying to, you know, follow through with the child um, until so they're the able to be on care, their own. Right. The extended care is actually for um, high school students, but it can go up to age 23. And then we have another program for other kids who are not in extended care, but for whom we will provide assistance, finding a home and employment and, mm -hmm. um, you know, all those adult things that you need to, to do when yeah. um, you don't have uh, adults helping you. Yeah, exactly. Just to make that transition to adulthood as smooth as possible. I remember one time having an agreement for a kid that was at school for who was turning 18 on a, in July and was at a full scholarship to Vermont Tech, but they didn't open till September. And there was fear of what would happen if he was on his own for two months. Um, the fear was well-founded by the way, but um, we were, he was not willing to provide a voluntary agreement, but I think BCF was willing to, continue him until he turned, uh, until he got to, to Vermont Tech. Um, the good news is he's doing very well now and he's in his 40s. That is good news. Yeah, that's the good news. The bad news is he never got to Vermont Tech. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's a little side story, but um, it's similar uh, problem. So um, I guess we'll, if Judge Zoni doesn't mind, we're going to jump to Aaron Jacobson. Um, and whether you, do you have similar concerns about the 18 to 21? And can you help with any of Senator Nick's questions or concerns? I can certainly try. Thank you for the record. My name is Aaron Jacobson. I am um, co-director of the Community Justice Division at the Attorney General's Office, but I'm also still part-time until March 4th at um, Vermont Law School's Immigration Clinic. So I'm wearing two hats and hopefully that's, um, you know, the primary hat here is just to provide some historical information about how we got to this bill, should that be helpful? But then yes, also to answer any questions that relate specifically to immigration and, and the bill itself. Um, the first question that, um, that relates to DCF's concerns regarding um, the, the intention of the bill to create an obligation for DCF to provide over 18 guardianships or an over 18 um, custody situation. That was not the intention of the bill. Um, and in fact, um, in the drafting, it was, that didn't even occur to us. Um, it didn't occur to me. I can't actually speak for um, um, attorney Wasserman, but um, it's, 
the, the most common situation you would see, um, which this bill is intended to provide for, is um, a youth who is about to turn 18 and so age out of the system um, such that then there's no juris, a court would not have jurisdiction over the care and custody determinations for that kid, whether that's a parentage um, or, you know, through a divorce or a, a guardianship in probate court. So to protect those kids who might continue to need some care, um, it was envisioned that there could be an extended guardianship just between like private parties, a kinship placement, for example, maybe a grandmother or a sister, or an uncle. Um, and then through that extended guardianship up to age 21, this bill would allow for the child to request the special findings um, from the probate court. So just giving the probate court um, both the jurisdiction to allow for this extended guardianship or even maybe for a new guardianship over for someone over 18 and to provide the requested special findings. That's really the only substantive expansion that we intended in terms of like a new program for kids over 18. Otherwise, it was the intent is really just to um, allow for courts to provide the special findings that are requested by the non-citizen child who needs the specific special order in order to then apply for immigration status with, with the federal agency. Um, it, again, it wasn't the intention that it would somehow create a new, new obligation by DCF. That wasn't, that wasn't what we envisioned. Um, so happy to keep working with Rebecca Wasserman and NBCF on that, um, and Rebecca Turner as well. Um, in terms of, oh, sorry. In terms Thank of, you. you're welcome. Senator Nick's questions, those are really good ones. Um, the, in terms of the referral to services, again, it wasn't envisioned that this was going to create some kind of obligation by um, programs to pay for these services. Um, I will say that I think was it this past summer, um, Vermont just expanded diner doctor, diner, Dr. Dinosaur <laughs> coverage um, to all Vermont, um, pregnant Vermonters and children, regardless of status. And I, if that did not go into effect in October, I think it might be this July. So to the extent that a child might be referred to a program that Medicaid can pay for, that non-citizen child should be eligible um, for that. Really, what those provisions are about, the referral for services, um, the provisions about thinking about a child's past situation, it's really to ensure that the court that is being asked to provide this, this, these special findings or the order is really thinking about the care and custody of the child, the needs of the child, the well being of the child. Because under federal immigration law, when the child then takes that order and goes to apply for special immigrant juvenile status, the immigration agency is, wants to be assured that the child was in court, in state court because not just because they need findings for a green card, but because the state court is the place um, where the judge sitting there has the expertise about care and custody of children. And that is in fact the underlying, um, uh, the underlying situation that is allowing the child to even be in, um, in the courthouse under the jurisdiction of the court. And so it's, this, this bill is actually modeled on Maine's Special Immigrant Juvenile Findings Bill, which is the most recently passed bill by any state and is, is passed um, at a time when the immigration agency was really cracking down on these Special Immigrant Juvenile Petitions. So what we attempted to do was to really make sure that it's clear in this bill 
that when the child is before a state court judge, it is, it's really about the care and custody and well-being of the child. That's what the state court judges have jurisdiction over and expertise in. Um, and so that's what some of these provisions are about, not to create some kind of um, obligation that would require funding to provide. So if, just to make sure I'm understanding, if the state court creates a guardianship over the child and the child is about to turn 18, when the child turns 18, they would be able to obtain those services either under Medicaid or whatever, you know, it could be in a, in a home with a kid, with a, an uncle or an aunt or something of that nature. Is that, that the scenario we're really talking about? And then Vermont Medicaid might pay for some of the services that were outlined in earlier in the bill that Senator Nick was asking about. It might, and I, I'm not an expert on Medicaid coverage and how far that coverage extends past the age of 18. Um, but in your, in your hypothetical, um, Chair Sears, that kid who is about to turn 18, who's already in a guardianship, that's precisely what the, the um, example that this bill is trying to address. So this kid has no status. Um, is about to turn 18, is in a guardianship, running out of time, otherwise under current law, to get the special finding she needs to then be able to get immigration status. This bill would allow for the guardian to extend the guardianship and would allow the probate court to, to issue the special findings um, should they be substantiated by, by the, the child who's asking for them. Um, and then if the probate court knew of some services that could, um, that, that, that the court could connect the child to, that would be fine. Um, it it so would just not, indicate that the court is really considering the care, custody, and well-being of the child. So DCF's concerns um, could be addressed by making clear that they're not necessarily in DCS custody. Absolutely. I think, I think it would just need some clarifying language that, that, that we could work with um, attorney Wasserman on. Um, yeah, unless there was a criminal case, they couldn't get, I don't think they can get into DCS custody after age of 18. Under raise the age, if there was a criminal case, but then that could affect their immigrant status, I would assume. It might. And that's a good question for DCF. My understanding is that they're, they don't have custody of kids over 18. They have these extended care agreements. Um, but I, I don't, I don't want, to, I'm not the expert about um, DCF custody over 18. Or Erica. Senator Sears. Yes. Or you, did you ask me a question in terms of the raise the age? Yeah. If, if the, you are correct that it would be under raise the age, the 18, age 18 and over, that would be a way uh, for custody to sort of come into DCF. And I'm not sure the the immigration laws, either, but I imagine that would impact that status. Yeah, well. that, that might actually impact the, the person's status to, to remain um, that would be for the immigration attorney to, to fight with yeah. DHS about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Aaron? Thank you so much for clearing some of that up. Does that help you, Senator Nicka? Well, I, th I think there are some risky parts here for DCF. So I think that maybe Aaron and um, DCF can work can work these things out somehow to clarify some things. Yeah. And if Betsy can help with that, um, perhaps during the town meeting week break, we can find some time to put together some language that helps with all of this. And we can come back to this after town meeting. Uh, but Judge Zone is, is our next witness on this subject. And Judge, welcome. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. Good morning. Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. The statute was originally enacted under Title 14, Section 3098, effective on October 7th of 2020. And the new statute adds a number of definitions and additional components to it. When I took a look at this, if you go to page three, line three, there was an addition that says an at-risk non-citizen child against whom charges have been filed in the criminal division may file a petition for special immigration status in the court. The court is defined as the family division or probate division in connection with the definition section that's been added. My question on this provision that has been suggested is why is it necessary? And I ask that because it seems to potentially sow some confusion to mentioning that if someone's in the criminal division, they can file it in the court. Well, is it the criminal court or is it the court that's actually defined in the statute? And the more fundamental question is, why is this section necessary? Because I, don't, I have not identified anything that says someone who has criminal charges can't file for this anyway. And so I'm not sure that subsection two under jurisdiction is necessary, but if, if it's found that it is necessary or believe that it is, I would suggest getting rid of the last three words that say in the court. That way it's, uh, there's no confusion about which court and it would clearly identify only the court uh, of the definition, which is the family division mm -hmm. and the probate division. The next part I want to talk about is still on page three. Previously, the statute as it's currently enacted says that if an order is requested from the court. The new language on line 12 says, if an at-risk non-citizen child petitions the court, thereby vesting the ability to petition in the non-citizen immigrant child. I'm sorry, where, what page are you on? Page three. Oh, I'm page sorry, I'm still on 12. page two. Okay. Page three, line there 12. There go, okay, I've got it. So it, it now, the proposed language, it says, if an at-risk non-citizen child petitions, and this raises the question of a child filing for his or her own order. We generally don't have that. Uh, it would be, for instance, if you're looking in the pr Title 14 for guardianships for minors, it says a parent or person interested in the welfare of a minor. Uh, if uh, DCF has custody, it may be appropriate to say uh, that uh, or state agency having custody, something like that to add. So you don't have a situation where it, it appears that statutorily a child would be the one filing their own petition. Yeah, I, I have a note here. It says it mirrors federal law. And that may be why, again, we don't have Betsy Wasserman here to help us with it, but that's probably where the language came from. It, I would suggest if you can maybe move the words a little bit, then uh, if a petition is filed on behalf of a non-citizen child, you can, something like that you might want to consider. But again, it, it, it should be clear who has the right to petition. Under our guardianship statutes for minors, it's clear. Under our relief from abuse statutes, it's clear that there has to be a parent or interested person for the uh, minors or a limited exception for individuals age 16 or older to file their own. Mm -hmm. the, the next section I want to touch on, we keep hearing about guardianship and, and I agree when you look on page four, at the bottom of page four, it talks about extension of guardianship in line 20. The intent of that from what I understand from Ms. Micah is for individuals who are minors who currently have a guardianship and therefore that guardianship will be continued. Well, that makes sense, but I do question, if you look at the first sentence, it says, at the request or consent of the at-risk non-citizen child presently under guardianship, comma, or with the consent of the person under guardianship, comma, the court may extend an existing guardianship. I may be missing something, but I don't see the necessity for both of those clauses because aren't we only dealing with the non-citizen 
child presently under guardianship who is actually the person under guardianship, which is the subject of the section. And if that's correct, I don't know that that second clause is necessary because this should only be covering the non-citizen child because that's all this statute is referring to. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yeah. So I, 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 again, I leave open that I might be missing something, but it just seems to me that it's referring to the same person, i.e. the ward under the guardianship that is already in existence for the minor. And I assume that that would be a minor guardianship that has been entered under Title 14, which gets us to then Section 5 on page 5, requesting an initial guardianship. What I understand this section to seek is that it wants to make it clear that for individuals who are 18 to 21, they're not deprived of seeking this status for purposes of going to court and getting the requisite order for use in federal uh, proceedings. It mentions the consent, which makes sense obviously, because this person is now an adult for purposes of making their own decisions, but the court may appoint a guardian to assist them. What does not appear clear is the procedure for that to occur. In other words, while this statute says that a certain category of individuals is now eligible for a guardianship, I cannot identify a statutory framework that this simply fits in and you then follow the procedures. In other words, is it, it's not a guardianship for a minor because that under Title 14, Section 2623, identifies people who are eligible for <coughs> minor guardianships as being under 18. And it would not seem to fit clearly within other provisions for individuals who may need guardianships. And so my, my question is, where does this fit into the guardianship scheme when a court gets this request, a petition saying, well, we're filing under this section for a guardianship. Where do we on the court plug it in to the statutes that exist for establishment of guardianships? And it doesn't seem to answer that question. And so I think it could lead to some confusion because again, it, it, there's no clear fit for guardianships. And I, uh, and I don't know if uh, Ms. Micah or others have considered that, but it seems as though it, it's creating a guardianship without the rules and statutes that tell us where it fits in. Hmm. But so that, those were my, my comments. I do know that our probate and family oversight committees, I believe it was oversight committees, have indicated they were talking about getting together to potentially consider a, a, a committee to look at this type of issue for coming up with uh, proposals and rules. But as of this time, I don't believe that had occurred. Okay. Okay, thank you, Judge. Uh, any questions for Judge Zoni? All right, thank you. Well, we've got a lot of work to do on this bill, uh, appears, and hopefully folks can get together um, and come up with some ideas or solutions. Um, I'd very much like to see this bill pass. I think it's important. Um, Thank you.